Dyeing fabric is a unique experience for the home sewer, so let's talk about it. When the Foundation's Revealed Competition theme was announced as storytelling, Ella Enchanted was almost an inevitable choice for me. To me, it is the definitive example of how to retell a fairy tale. How to build a heroine who is both unique but recognizable, to demonstrate growth with inconsistent characterization. Of course I would make my competition entry from Ella Enchanted. Today we'll talk about the process of dyeing the silk that I used for the garment, and how I made the petticoat with a gradient of purples. But first, for those who are unfamiliar, here's an introduction to Ella Enchanted. I won't be spoiling anything here. Ella Enchanted is a children's fantasy novel retelling of the Cinderella story. Ella is the daughter of a kind and very funny noblewoman, and a distant merchant father who's hardly ever home. Upon her birth, she is gifted by the horrifically misguided fairy Lucinda with the virtue of obedience, meaning she must obey any direct command she is given. Her mother and her fairy godmother, the family cook, are the only ones who know about the gift slash curse. When Ella's mother unexpectedly passes away when Ella is about 14, her life is altered substantially. She becomes friends with the crown prince Charmant, Char for short, who admired her mother and was present at her funeral. Soon after, Ella's father sends her away to finishing school to make a lady of her. Two of her schoolmates are extremely unpleasant, wealth-obsessed sisters who make her life miserable when one of them discovers Ella's obedience, even if she doesn't understand the cause. I won't go into any more detail right now, because even though it's a fairy tale, this retelling still holds up enough on its own, and I don't want to spoil anything if you haven't read it, which I highly recommend. It's fantastic. Ella Enchanted might be the book I've truly loved the longest. I must have read it thousands of times. My mother tells me that once or twice she would see me finish it and immediately turn to the first page again without even closing the book. And I've heard similar stories from other parents. It is compelling like a fairy tale retelling never has been before. When I was 10 years old, I was visiting a friend out of town and I lent her the book to read. She wasn't a big reader at the time and this was starting to cause some distance in our friendship since that's basically all I did at the time. She read my copy of Ella Enchanted so many times that instead of sending back the original copy, she sent a brand new copy because the old one was in such terrible shape that it wouldn't have survived a trip through the post. That new copy now looks like this. All right, before we go on, I have to acknowledge the enormous elephant in the room. Like many readers, I sometimes find filmic adaptations of beloved stories to be disappointing. Sometimes I can understand the changes, and other times I can't, but I'll live with them. I don't usually hold it against the filmmakers, or actively discourage viewing of the movie. My taste might not be your taste, and that's okay. You might like an adaptation of a book, and you might never read it, so you still want to know the story. In cases like these, I try my best to have an opinion without trying to maintain that it's the only opinion. And just because I don't like something doesn't mean that other people can't find value in it. The movie adaptation, so-called, of Ella Enchanted, which was released in 2004, is a travesty. Never in my life have I felt so completely betrayed, taken in, personally wounded by a film adaptation. At the age of 14, less than 20 minutes into this appalling crime in the name of adaptation, I turned to my mother in the theater and said, I can't take it, I'm going to take the bus home. My mother, who also loves this novel, said, Fair enough, I'll let you know if it gets better. It only got worse, apparently. I was recently directed to Dominic Noble's channel, where he hosts a series called Lost in Adaptation. The video about Ella Enchanted is a pretty excellent and funny breakdown, if you're interested. Link below. Alright, so now that that bit of ranting is out of the way, let's talk about the next phase in this project of mine. The skirts by way of the dyeing process. Those of you who watched my historical Halloween video will remember that I was gifted with an absurd quantity of secondhand curtains made of red silk taffeta. I didn't even use half of that fabric for the Halloween gown, so when a 17th century ball gown was in the works, I naturally thought of all that leftover fabric. But I didn't want this gown to be red. Red feels antithetical to the character of Ella. It's just not her color, you know? In the novel, there are three masked balls. The ball gowns described are green, a silvery blue slash purple, and then the last, her favorite, is white. White seemed out of my reach from a dyeing standpoint, and it might come across a little bit more like a wedding gown on film, and green, yeah, no. Green and red, even with careful dye removal, are not colors that generally play well together. The combination gets muddy very quickly, and I didn't have the kind of time needed to do that kind of experimenting. So I did my best to produce a silver 
silvery blue, or at least a pale purple on the blue side of the spectrum. But first I had to lift the red dye. This was accomplished with RIT Dye Remover. Not a sponsor or anything, but pretty much the only brand of dye lifter I've seen around. Okay, a quick tangent here to warn you that the smell of this stuff is no joke. It's just sodium dithionite, known more commonly as sodium hydrosulfide, to reduce confusion with a similarly named compound used for inorganic chemistry, fun fact. But it's just a low toxicity reduction of sulfur dioxide. But being a sulfurous compound of any kind, the smell is... powerful. I didn't mind it so much, but I can't deny that it really permeates the air, and my spouse hated it. So most of the day was spent with the windows open and the fans blowing the whole time. The dye lifting worked, with mixed results. There was a big variance in color removal, which was directly correlated with various individual panels of the curtains, so probably the fabric was not all woven with the exact same fibers, and maybe not even in the same factory. The panels that did not lift as much dye are probably a polyester blend of some kind, because the dye remover has a different effect on synthetic fibers. This is not uncommon. After all, these are curtains, an assembled consumer product, not wholesale fabric. It's probably that the company making the curtains sourced red silk taffeta from different manufacturers and assembled the pieces, relying on the consistency of the fiber content. It happens. Fabric retails are reliant on their manufacturer's word like anyone else, and it's not always in their power to test all their incoming fabric. However, regardless of the effectiveness of the dye lift, the result was almost universally a pinker shade than could feasibly be dyed light blue. Any blue, unless it was quite dark, would show some pink through to make a purple shade. So I leaned into the purple. To make the most of all of the fabric, regardless of the level of dye lift, I decided to create a gradient of color which would showcase the voluminous skirts, and then I could more subtly incorporate different purples into the rest of the costume. Purple is a color which actually appears quite often in Ella Enchanted. One of my favorite purple moments is when she's shown into her dorm at finishing school. The amount of purple in there almost knocks her over. The overpowering assortment of purple is an object of humor at the expense of the headmistress's poor taste and the superficiality of the skills that Ella is about to learn at the school. It's a very funny moment. Many of the purples I produced were very lilac-y, which is a pinky purple flower generally. The lilac flower actually weirdly plays a role in the novel as well. It's the smell that precedes any appearance of Lucinda, the fairy who cursed Ella. I'll go more into lilacs in general in the next video, but I thought that this was a happy accident, so I went with it. Not for nothing, but I defy anyone not to feel like a powerful witch or benevolent fairy godmother when bent over a stove of boiling hot colorful liquid. So I finished with my dyeing after several days of taking over most of the kitchen, thanks to my patient spouse, and now I had miles and miles of pinky purple silk in various shades. I know that a lot of people right now are clutching their pearls at the heat and water that I'm treating this silk with, and I know that the general faux pas about getting silk wet has made us all a little bit nervous about this. But please note that this is cast off fabric that I neither paid for, nor was in an ideal condition when I received it. It had been used in windows as curtains, so there was light bleaching and pre-existing wear. Also, no guts, no glory, right? This was a risk. The risk I was taking was not one of money or of pride, but of wasted time. This is a lengthy process, and if it didn't work out, I would have lost nothing but time, but that was the scarcer commodity in the end.
As Mr. Darcy once said, I am more likely to want time than courage. When I was done dyeing the silk, I dipped some of the original curtain lining into the dye. It's a poly cotton blend, so the dye didn't take in the same way, but I had a lot of dye left over, and so it didn't really much matter what I used it for. I used that poly cotton to make an under petticoat. It didn't need to be dyed, it wouldn't be seen at all, but I thought it was fun and would distinguish itself from other plain white petticoats and under petticoats that I have lying around. The under petticoat construction might take longer to talk about than it actually took to do. It's just two panels of about two yards each, sewn together and gathered pretty haphazardly into a twill tape waistband. Almost no effort was done there. I just needed the volume for the skirts. Interestingly, in the mid-1600s, there appears to be a time with very little in the way of extra padding. Even the unassuming waist roll had mostly disappeared from my research, and the voluminous skirts were mostly achieved with under petticoats and generous pleating. Then, towards the 18th century, we go back to the pocket hoops and other understructures. So how was I going to do this skirt business with this very wide variety of purples? I decided to build a gradient of purples. I had a thought that it would make it seem more intentional, and also I was curious to see what the effect would be with all that cartridge pleating, which was going to hide most of the seams and build a lot of volume towards the back. So I decided to have the pinker, paler fabric at the front, and then increase the blue and intensity of color as the panels move towards the back of the petticoat. Petticoats and skirts from the 17th century, from what I could find, did not seem to have a huge number of seams unless you were creating a train effect. The volume is largely based on pleating and gathering, and not so much shaping with panels. However, I wanted to have a train, so I slightly adapted my Victorian skirt pattern from my Halloween project. Because I wasn't going to have a cage crinoline creating the massive bell shape, the gown would drape in a more gradual train shape with very little alteration to the panels. So I went to work. Because of the aforementioned wear in the curtains, I had to strategically cut pieces to reduce the amount of mending that I would have to do. I did, however, have to sew up a few worn bits. Luckily, the pleating seems to have hidden those successfully from view. The panels were sewn together with a running backstitch, a method of stitching that has one or two backstitches followed by three or so running stitches, and then repeating. Skirts don't take much tension when they're this voluminous, so they didn't need to be as firmly stitched as fitted items like bodices. Once I sewed all of the panels together, I basted two huge panels of the poly cotton curtain lining to the inside of the waistband edge. Then I cartridge pleated the skirt and lining with three rows of parallel running stitches along that same top edge. The lining helped give that substance to those pleats, and they hold their shape much better with that extra structure. I arranged the front to be flatter and almost entirely unpleated, as this seems to have been the fashion, and then tightened the pleating incrementally as we move towards the back of the skirt. I cut a waistband to size, and then attached it with full back stitches on the inside. Waistbands tend to take a lot of pressure in several directions. The tension from pulling it around your waist, as well as the weight of the fabric that it's holding up, all have to be held up, so back stitches here had to be really firm. The waistband was finished with a short length of red grosgrain ribbon on each end, which I used to tie the skirt closed. I genuinely have no idea if this is historically accurate or not. By this time in the process, I was so hurried that I wasn't even looking at books anymore. I was just getting it done. I definitely left too much open at the back seam. I need to stitch that up a bit. You can very clearly see my under petticoat. Scandalous. But otherwise, I really like the effect of the various colors on the skirt. It's not meant to be a seamless ombre transition, but the effect is still pleasing, I think. It's not flawless in its execution, but altogether I think it was a really fun experiment, both in dyeing and in garment assembly. And uh, can I tell you a little secret? Just between friends? It's not hemmed yet.
that is going to be a few days of hand sewing in bed to accomplish, and I just haven't been bothered. Perhaps this week. Editing Liz can update you on that. <laughs> Good one. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. A big shout out to all of my Patreon patrons who have signed up already, but especially Avery, my very first patron to select a tier in which you get a verbal shout out in the next video I release. Thank you so much, Avery. It means so much to me. If you want to join my Patreon, sign up at the link below. Perks include fun extras like photos and short videos, voting power on future projects, and exclusive insights into my culture and projects. I also accept Kofi donations if you prefer. Come back next week for a video about all of the accessories and the mask that I made for this costume. See you soon! Oh, and then the... Too many things are happening. But I didn't want... <laughs> Teleprompter... What do you do to me? It's just sodium dithionite. Dithionite? Dithionite? It's sodium dith dithionite. Why does this keep happening to me? Why does this keep happening to me? Teleprompter, why do you hate me? The certain panels that did not lift as much... The certain panels that did not lift... This is going to go on for a while. Ah! Liz is enraged at her teleprompter. She's going to eat it. It had been used in curtains as windows. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> that light's going to be a problem, isn't it? I wonder how long that's been going on. Oh, that's okay. It's a, it's a cool sci-fi lens flare effect. Yeah, that's what we're going to call it. Oh, I don't want to record that again. <laughs> You're just gonna have to live with it, guys, because I'm not recording that again. Oh, goodness. All right. I'll see you guys next time.